This is the, the, the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Nathan Williams here from Analysis in Chains, part of CryptoNews.com, your daily source of all things crypto. I'm sitting here with Miko Arasala, the founder and CEO of InBot. Uh, we are at the Blockchain Visionaires Summit here today. It's a beautiful day, uh, talking with all sorts of people from, uh, from all aspects of crypto. And uh, Miko, thank you for taking some time to be on the podcast. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we have a very nice view here, like uh, directly to the river and uh, uh, sitting outside enjoying the sun in the summer. Uh, I actually came from Helsinki um, for a quick visit in Berlin. I do live in Berlin, but uh, this time I'm spending the summertime in Helsinki. For some reason, Helsinki is actually hotter than, than uh, Berlin at this time. Yeah, I heard about that. It's, uh, it, it's, they're Quite having like, the wildfires up in the, in the Arctic Circle oh, and everything. That too. Uh, so yeah, it's been the hottest summer in, probably in the history of Finland. You know, so you global gotta, warming for you. Got to come down to Berlin to escape the heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really weird. <laughs> like, Tell our listeners a little bit about InBot. Like, uh, Miko, uh, what exactly are, is the problem that you're solving? Yeah, so uh, we found it in bot uh, because we look at the marketing automation as a market and uh, um, we saw that there's about 7,000 applications currently in marketing automation. It's the most common way for businesses to grow. Uh, so the problem is that, that uh, marketing automation is based on lies and deceit. So people are creating these robots that are communicating to you and pretending to be humans. Mm -hmm. They're trying to like uh, coerce you to think that there's some sales guy who cares about you while as there's only a robot that tries to capture money without the sales guy doing anything. Right. Uh, okay, of course, it's a, it's a nice way of growing business if it works, uh, but we wanted to find a way of uh, growing businesses that that scales from a position of trust, that, that increases trust, not, not lose trust. And and uh, it was it was initially um, when we were started researching how we can build a mechanism that grows businesses from a position of trust, uh, we came to the conclusion that the best way of doing that is to uh, scale the discovery of people who can introduce you to clients. Because if you can find that discovery, uh, you have the trust built in. Because the trust has been built in with the friends of the customers. Referrals, and if can, persons yes, uh, introducing uh, you to who they we know. We found out that uh, Harvard Business Review wrote an article that said that about 84% of all B2B deals start with the referral. So we came to the conclusion that a lot of this hustling of, of, for the growth um, is... Um, it's basically for nothing, you know, and it, it doesn't really help you. Uh, and what you really should do is to scale referrals. Mm. And this is what LinkedIn has been for. And but the problem is that no individual knows a lot of people. So like uh, like you have um, maybe one or two or three or maybe five people that you know that you can introduce that are somehow meaningful for any business. No matter who you are, you can be any kind of sales kind of thing. So once we once we figured this out that this could be an interesting way, we started building an artificial intelligence that does the discovery. Mm -hmm. We call it the people graph, and uh, we built it for three years. Uh, we raised about three million to do that. Sort of like uh, a recommendation engine for your referrals. It's like a matchmaking for business. Yeah, like um, business Tinder. You know, like, <laughs> but swipe left, <laughs> swipe right. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing is that it's completely automated in the background. So so you don't have any like a user interface for the end users to do that. So the discovery is happening in the background and then you get recommendations from the engine that, uh, that, that this guy can introduce you to this person and the customer and this guy can introduce you to this person. Would you like to get these introductions? Hmm. So of course we built in also a mechanism of, of uh, rewarding people for doing these introductions because this kind of re reciprocity never exists like in a, in a true, true form. Like if you can make two introductions to somebody, they probably cannot make similar amount to you, mm -hmm. but they may be able to do it to somebody else who can then can be uh, making them to you. So like this, in in uh, total, these introductions probably even out. Mm -hmm. But uh, but uh, in practice, in order to scale these kind of introductions, you have to have a mechanism of paying. So last and year, also we, a lot. Of, there are some people that know everybody, and then you know they end up it's, giving disproportion. Yeah. So the thing is that that nobody knows everybody. Like mm -hmm. uh, you can be an influencer. I am an influencer myself, like I have about a million viewers a month on my LinkedIn posts. And, and if, I, if I look from my point of view, the fact that I'm an influencer increases my chances of, uh, of making introductions to people that don't know me well, mm. because they know me from my, through my posts and you know, through what I say. 
So that is that is true. You can you can scale influence, but you really cannot scale trust. You know, in the sense that you can only spend time with about 150 people. That's the number number. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, if you start spending time with some other people, then you lose contact to somebody else. So so the trust circle for everybody is relatively small. So yeah, you if you take a combined effect of the trust circle and then the influence circle. Uh, that's what you can reach out to with by anyone. How do and, you scale the trust circle? Like, how do you uh, how do you recognize uh, who in your uh, or, or does the algorithm do that? Does it recognize who's in your trust circle and who's in your sort of influence? Yeah, circle that's part of it. Yeah, so so basically, uh, in LinkedIn, you know, you're using your trust circle to find like you you look at who knows who you know. Uh, the, I mean, so, so you, you're looking for the customer, then you look if there's anybody in, in between you and the customer, right? Hmm. And then if you find a person from there, uh, then you go and ask for introduction. Of course, you can only ask it so many times before you have to start giving back. I mean, yeah. nothing, nothing works like forever. Like <laughs> Nothing's one free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so uh, we wanted to scale that by, by helping to get you introduced to all of those people who know those customers everywhere in the world. So you don't have to know them in advance, but you can make friends with them before you get introduced. And, and this, this is good for everyone. It's good for you as a business because you start building your friendships towards the directions that are useful for your business. Mm -hmm. But it also benefits the other guys on the other end who are helping you get introduced because they are expanding their circles internationally at the same time. And if you have a good business, you know, it's really, really cool to be a good friend of a CEO of a, of, of a successful growth company. So for these introductions, it's also good to know you. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, so we, we started that and we saw some pretty amazing success last year in terms of conversion rates. So we had uh, between 25 and 50% conversion rates from introductions to deals. And we studied like the revenue growth started to take off, but we did have one problem with it. And this problem was that uh, we did not have any mechanism of engaging our community members while they were not making introductions. Mm -hmm. And so vast majority of our community members stayed idle. You know, you, you, if you make an introduction in February and then you make another one in September, you probably don't even remember that you were part of a community like at the moment anymore. And this was a huge problem for us because because we had to, every time we, we start this conversation, they, the it business... It's like a new introduction to the to your old community that yeah. didn't even remember they were part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so we look at, is there any way that we can engage these community members in a more meaningful way uh, while they are not making those introductions? Can we engage them to bring in more members to the community and so on? And we came to the conclusion that, the, because, I mean, of course, uh, I have a background in the games industry as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew that the games were doing it by with virtual currency. We're thinking that we could use the same mechanics of engagement that, that the games are using, uh, but for business. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are basically going to incentivize people with the cryptocurrency to invite their friends, add their data, you know, like make introductions, but there's all kinds of other things they can do with the system that, that also pays them a little bit. Did and that work? It did work amazingly well. So, so we announced this uh, tokenized model of the community in January this year. Uh, we had about 3,000 members at the time mm -hmm. on the community, most of which were phased out because we didn't have any engagement. Um, and, and now we have 63,000 members. So we went 20 times over. And uh, not only did we go 20 times over, but our social media posts like uh, for the uh, for for Inbot, like our company, uh, are currently at about 1.1 million views a month. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to my personal one million, so we have like social media reach of over two million now, um, just because of our community engagement. And and uh, we do have about 764 last time I checked uh, companies who registered on our website to be want to be a, as vendors on our platform during this time. So it's crazy amount of companies who are interested. Out of which we have currently received uh, um, uh, over 60 uh, sales pitches that we are now adding to the uh, wallet interface so people can make introductions for them. So, uh, so yeah, we are growing now the vendor base uh, at the same time as we are growing the community. Congratulations. That's, uh, that's a big achievement. Now, how, uh, to switch gears a little bit, uh, one of the big things that I've been talking to a lot of people about has been GDPR. Now that it has come into effect, it is affecting a lot of people, especially in the blockchain space when you have uh, things like personal yeah. data that gets immutable. How has Inbot been responding to uh, this sort yeah, of... Yeah, so we, we took uh, carefully, I mean, so we have always been very privacy friendly. Uh, our network model is not that of a public network. Hmm. It's that you upload your individual contacts to your own account, and then the AI does matchmaking against the contact base that is out there. Mm -hmm. You can always delete your account, and then all the contacts go away. So, so that's that's re relatively like some, you cannot do networking with more privacy-friendly way than we are doing. Yeah. So the only thing we had to add really for GDPR because we of course 
uh, look at the, uh, the what the law says uh, was was that that uh, we disclose how we use the information, we disclose the rights of the users, mm -hmm. and we let them to delete their accounts if they want to get rid of that data. And and uh, we were GDPR compliant uh, already before the GDPR uh, like law went into action. So mm -hmm. we were well prepared, and I think. This could be like a new way of doing networking in the world of the GDPR and this kind of privacy friendliness. Now, when you're talking about um, uh, building something like a networking app on blockchain, you're, I imagine that you would be doing it on Ethereum, correct? Yeah, so we, we did build an ERC contract uh, mm -hmm. for, for our tokens. Uh, we are not completely decentralized system because, because we are a system of trust, mm -hmm. not a trustless system that, that the completely decentralized ones are. So we have to ha offer a party for the businesses to contract with and a party for the ambassadors to contract with. However, we are planning to make this party that they are contracting with AI-driven. Ah. So, so uh, our goal is to make this into autonomous organization that is facilitating all these introductions uh, for, for these users. So we are a purpose-driven um, company. We, we uh, want to build this in a way that, that we can return all the value uh, that the community creates back to the community. And in the long term, we want to see this as a mechanism of, of people to participate the success of businesses without being employed by them. Uh, because I do not see that in the long term, given my history in AI, uh, I do not believe in human employment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will go away with AI eventually. And it's not going to take like a multiple, like I said, multiple, I mean, it's going to take multiple decades to, to eradicate the jobs, but it's not going to take much longer than that. It's interesting to hear you say that because uh, I've talked to a number of people speaking about the, this idea of the end of human employment and, mm -hmm. and I'm often greeted with skepticism like, oh, in the past there are, mm -hmm. there's always been uh, more jobs, but do you really see it, uh, it, it moving away that we're going to be in more of a Star Trek society where robots will be doing more of the jobs? And, yeah, so uh, one of the things that, that, that people don't understand is that when you replace like a white collar specialist, you don't need to have a robot for that. You know, you don't have a robot to replace a doctor. I mean, you may need to have a robot for doing surgeries, but you don't need to have a robot, like an army of robots that replace doctors all over the world. You just have one to, You just need to have one piece of software, which is uh, run by artificial intelligence that does diagnosis and therapeutic, therapeutic recommendations. Hmm. You can already do 80% of a doctor's job that way. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, the algorithms uh, controlled by Google, Microsoft, and IBM and others uh, have about 97% accuracy in most of the diseases in terms of its diagnostic capability. The thing is that an average doctor has about 70% uh, uh, hit rate on, on their recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, they can increase it by using Google, uh, but then the whole point of having the doctor in the middle starts going away, right? Right. So, so uh, a human mind can only store that, that much information. It's biased. It has problems. Um, the artificial intelligence lying in the cloud can use all the bits of information from the whole history of a human being and it doesn't have to forget about anything about it. And it can combine that data with the whole history of all the doctors on the planet who haven't done any diagnosis. So it's easy to see how they can be replaced. And the same is true for almost every single one of these white-collar specialist jobs. Apparently business development is one of them, eh? Absolutely. Well, so, well, with, with InBot, you're the, this, is, uh, this is something people don't think about. Oh, we always need someone to do the referrals or to do business development, but uh, no. But that's I, it. Like, you, know, you're, you can do referrals. I mean, humans are still doing the trust building, but that's pretty much the only thing they need to do because everything else is coordinated and driven by artificial intelligence. So, so, so yeah, if you if you look at this, I actually think that that a lot of the uh, like specialist uh, uh, white collar jobs that are currently like the best paid ones you know in the world are going to go away for artificial intelligence much per much earlier than this lower paid. Let's say if you're a barista in a coffee shop, mm -hmm. it's more likely that you keep your job than uh, you keep your job as a lawyer or doctor or something like accountant, you know, and so on. Because the point is more of the trust building with the barista and the tr coffee shop. No, the, the barista the doesn't cost too much, and if yeah. you put the robot to pour those coffees, people will probably not like that. Yeah. Uh, if if uh, if your lawyer is replaced by AI and it charges you one tenth or one hundredth of what the lawyer charges, you're probably totally okay with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will probably said no years for the human level of jobs <laughs> going away. Possibly. Uh, in terms of doctors, um, people say that, but, well, but you want to have a human doctor. I would say that you would want to have a human nurse. You know, mm. the nurse who tells you, like, uh, like uh, uses the emotional intelligence to basically comfort you in your bad moment. 
you don't want the doctor to be that person. I mean, you want hmm. doctor to be uh, honest well, with the assessment, you know, and telling exactly what the problem is. You want is. them to be a little bit more robotic, you know, in a sense, detached. Well, yeah, you, you want the doctor to be able to say to you that you have a cancer, hmm. you know, no sugar coating. Like, I mean, you, it's literally you need to know what your problem is. Yeah. So the nurse can be the comporter then, like hmm. saying, that, oh, <laughs> you have a problem, and it's like, and they do all the caring. So I would say that the AI doctor is totally fine. Hmm. Like, I mean, there's no problem. You, you still probably won't have a human nurse, but that's a different job, like, in, so from, from that point of view. So tell me, uh, Miko, how do we prepare for uh, for a future like this? Well, like, what's a human's role in a future where human uh, human employment is not necessary? Yeah, we need to change our models of society. I, I, I do think that we are starting to approach the expiry of the nation states. You know, the nation states... Uh, are mostly now hurting us more than helping in many ways. Like you have uh, lots of the small elites in a lot of countries like uh, Turkey and Russia and the United States and China, for example, where the oligarchs are controlling the uh, like uh, all kinds of places like media, voting process, you know, and elections, you know, and, and other things that basically keep them in power. So now the problem with, with that is that um, if, you, if you want to create a fair... Uh, like society and environment for ourselves we need to find new ways of first of all funding those kind of uh, services that we are currently getting from government including healthcare, education and so on hmm. and I think that all of that can be solved by artificial intelligence like I mean, if you build an AI doc- like AI doctor why can't you build like an AI teacher as well hmm. and then if you have all of those available and you are offered, offering them universally maybe using blockchains as a mechanism of universal participation um you could build all of those services that are currently provided by humans via these tax, taxing processes of, of governments and offer them as free services for everybody. And and it I could think, be decentralized going beyond the borders of the nation states. Yeah, exactly. Then, then you don't need the states anymore because you can offer the same education to the kid in Turkey and India than you can give to the kid in Germany or Finland. Hmm. So, so I, think, I think that would be a um, like way of, of improving on the current system while we are transforming to a new in like a uh, era that that has uh, artificial intelligence in power instead of us mm. and so so yeah i mean inbot is one of those projects where we are trying to help that happen so we we want to uh, help people earn long term income from their help for these businesses without being employed by those companies uh, we also want to help uh, promote artificial intelligences that are helping us not mm. hurting us i think way too big portion of the current artificial intelligence development is going into addiction algorithms, which are uh, trying to get you spend maximum amount of your time with specific social networks or games or TV series or whatever it is that these companies are doing. Mm. They're using any and all algorithms to, to keep you To addicted. keep you there. <laughs> yeah, and it's working really well. So an average American is spending about 12 hours a day in front of some screen. That uh, sounds about right. So it, it, either phone or TV or computer or whatever it is. So if you're having this kind of level of addiction to these, these forms, I don't think it's any more healthy. Hmm. But uh, these companies are driven by profits, so they have the incentive of striving it all the way to a point that, that people are basically destroying their lives. Hmm. And there are lots of game companies are destroying a lot of lives by addictions hmm. and, and so on. So it's already happening in that sense. However, if we build artificial intelligences that, that served us in terms of our basic needs that hmm. they're currently provided by government, um, then we do not need those governments. So if they lose the tax base because of the artificial intelligence, it's not a problem. Because not a problem same, for, because for the, the because person. They, yeah, because, because <laughs> yeah. the artificial intelligence that, that destroyed your job also provides you now all the services that, that you need at the same time. So the problem, like the solution lies in the, the problem itself. Bringing it back to InBot for a moment, I just want to ask you what we can expect from InBot going forward. Yes, yeah, so we are currently in a pre-sale phase for the, for the token sale. We are hoping to uh, graduate from this pre-sale phase to, to ICO relatively soon and then uh, list the tokens and continue business. We already have huge demand in the business side, as, as, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, we already have a lot of community action. So, so right now... Uh, it's about navigating the current uh, low tide in the crypto markets and, and uh, uh, being able to raise enough from this current token sale process uh, to realize this vision that we have. And, uh, and uh, it would be easy to do that via institutional investments, 
but the institutional investors want to have equity mm-hmm. and they want to take a long-term economic rent from the community to pay, like I said, shareholder returns. Yep. And we don't like that. You know, we want to create a mechanism where people can collectively benefit from this AI and it's not aggregating everything to, hmm. to, to some small. So we have to raise our funding from a collective of, much larger collective of individuals uh, who are part of our community and who are the beneficiaries. So if anyone listening is interested in getting involved with, uh, with this or with InBot, what would they do? Yeah, just sign up on uh, InBot.io and uh, create a wallet account. We reward you for sharing data with us. And, uh, and uh, we, of course, reward you well for your introductions for businesses. Uh, we reward you for inviting your friends. And uh, if you have uh, ability of participating um, on this token sale, we offer currently quite nice bonuses for the pre-sale participants, up to 40%. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, that's, that's how, to, how to participate. Uh, as a disclaimer, uh, this token sale is not available for the citizens or uh, residents of United States and mm-hmm. China. Best of luck with the token pre-sale. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Miko. And hopefully we'll hear good things from Inbot going forward. Oh, yeah. Lots of good news coming every day.